Today, I'd like to consider fan fiction about Tolkien's world, the history of this vast community and how it is used and not used storytelling to address issues of representation and diversity in Middle Earth. To begin, what is fan fiction? I could devote a 20 minute paper to the finer points of the debate around the definition of a term that for most of us can probably be summed up along the lines of Justice Potter Stewart's definition of pornography. You know it when you see it. For my purposes, I will consider fan fiction as any fictional work that draws elements from an existing literary media or other text. Furthermore, fan fiction writers do not receive monetary compensation for their work, distinguishing them culturally from the producers of big budget adaptations. Peter Jackson and company are the most salient example in this case, even if their creative processes look remarkably the same. When I say that fan fiction writers and the writers of sanctioned adaptations differ culturally from one another, I begin to get to the heart of my paper today. Sanctioned adaptations such as the Peter Jackson film trilogies tend to retain and even amplify racist and sexist aspects of the legendarium. A generation of fans once free to imagine orcs however they please, for example, now assume they are dark skinned and dreadlocked. Women characters in heroic roles, some of them canonical such as Eowyn, others elevated such as Arwen and others invented entirely like Tariel, still find their romantic interests centered in a way that they are not for characters like Aragorn and queer characters remain entirely absent. For decades now, fan studies scholars have asserted that fan fiction is different. Unbeholden to powerful economic interests that benefit from maintaining the status quo, fan fiction writers have the potential to transform text to make room for typically marginalized voices. Fan studies scholars overall would assert this as a, if not the primary purpose of fan fiction. For example, in a 2006 article, Abigail Derecho termed fan fiction the literature of the subordinate for its potential to open text to perspectives and voices excluded by publishing and media industries that have only recently and feebly begun to stir towards realizing that a tiny minority of the world's population, cisgender straight white males, does not in fact hold all the good stories. Tolkien scholar Una McCormick speaking specifically of Tolkien-based fan fiction, made a similar assertion with her idea of reparative reading, that fans who do not see themselves in the stories can use fan fiction to expand the legendarium to include more diverse perspectives. For anyone interested in more diverse stories, the possibilities represented by fan fiction become enormous and exciting. Before I begin, I want to define a fan fiction term I'm going to use a lot, canon. By this, we don't mean the artistic works that lie at the foundation of a culture, but the set of facts about a secondary world, in this case Arda, that are accepted by the majority of fans as true of that world. While fan fiction communities vary in the importance they place on the canon, Tolkien fan fiction communities tend to highly value knowledge of the canon. Because Tolkien's canon is far from straightforward, details and interpretations enshrined by fans as canon often reveal whose perspectives are privileged in the stories created by a particular community. Fan fiction about Tolkien's legendarium has existed since at least 1957, and in the age of online fan fiction has become one of the largest, most prolific fandoms. Due to its prodigious size and longevity, therefore, I want to offer the reminder that I cannot speak for every Tolkien fan fiction community, much less every Tolkien fan fiction writer that has existed across the vast breadth and depth of its history. At its peak in the early 2000s, there were hundreds of Tolkien fan fiction groups, some with thousands of members and others with just a few. It is impossible to represent the values and practices of them all. For this presentation, I have gathered information using two approaches. First is that of a historian. Some of the early Tolkien fan fiction groups are still online. Others have been archived by fandom historians over the years. I've gone back to those groups to see how members discuss gender, race, and sexuality. To capture a more contemporary perspective, I use results from the Tolkien Fan Fiction Survey, open to all writers and readers of Tolkien-based fan fiction, which I ran first in 2015 and again in 2020 in collaboration with Maria Alberto. So to return to the question at the heart of my presentation today, do Tolkien fan fiction writers use their craft to foreground the perspectives and experiences of marginalized groups? Tolkien's Legendarium, at least in terms of mainstream readings to this point, reflects much of Western literature and media in either excluding these perspectives, such as the lack of women characters, or relegating members of a group or a stereo to a stereotyped or caricatured role, such as an over-reliance on dark-skinned villains. There is a similar lack of queer and working-class characters. As Una McCormick discussed in her essay on reparative reading, 
fan fiction writers can address these shortcomings in several ways. First is to invent an original character belonging to a marginalized group to coexist alongside characters from the canon. Secondly, fan fiction writers can develop minor characters who belong to, or who could belong to, a marginalized group. Finally, fan fiction writers can take a character who has a major role and center his or her perspective as a member of a marginalized group. For example, focusing on Aon's experience as a woman fighting in a war, or Samwise Gamgee's perspective as the sole working class member of the fellowship. Historically, Tolkien fan fiction has undertaken this work most often for two groups of characters, women and queer characters. In both cases, the reaction of the wider fan fiction community has shown this to be a fraught endeavor with responses often outsized and mirroring the oppressive backlash faced by real world members of these groups. Following the release of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films, interest in Tolkien based fan fiction exploded on the internet. One particular genre was so popular that it was given its own name, the 10th Walker story. In these stories, a highly idealized girl or young woman, often based on the author and called a self-insert, joined the fellowship on their quest. She typically attracted the romantic interest of at least one of the book characters, and this is where the story often focused. Authors of 10th Walker stories were typically teen girls. Taking in a wider view of Western storytelling, none of this is terribly radical. After all, the idea of an ordinary, even underwhelming boy or man discovering that he has exceptional talents and using them, in many cases, to literally save the world, is a common trope in stories that have commanded the adoration of millions of fans, such as Spider-Man or Harry Potter. Nor are self-inserts inherently a byword in fiction. Many male authors write self-inserts to great acclaim. Tolkien himself wrote one. Finally, as a teacher who works with young adolescents, this is an age where young people become alive to the full breadth and possibilities of the world around them, while not yet fully cognizant of its limitations, limitations too often prescribed by the demographic group they belong to. In other words, kids of this age dream big. Therefore, there was nothing culturally or developmentally unusual about the 10th Walker phenomenon in young women writers responding to a text they loved by making room to see themselves as characters with enough agency to shape the story. One would not have known it from the reaction of the broader Tolkien fan fiction community. Here, I want to give fair warning that I will be discussing threats of violence, suicide, and self-harm, often directed towards adolescents. If you're not up for this kind of content today, check back with me in about two minutes. Responses to these young women's stories were vicious and came from both from fans acting individually as well as parts of or organized campaigns. One such organization called Protectors of the Plot Continuum, or PPC, which still exists today, originated with the primary intention to mock authors of so-called Mary Sue stories, a term I'll discuss more in a moment, and that includes 10th Walkers. The quotes on the screen from the PPC's website show how their responses to these stories were presented in explicitly violent terms. While the PPC mocked many genres of story, the section of their website devoted to Mary Sue stories is the only section that uses this kind of violent language. And while the PPC asserts the fictionalization of their violent acts, it is significant that Mary Sue's are a genre where the author is the character targeted and the female author at that. While the PPC merely mocked stories, other fans went further and sometimes threatened writers of 10th Walker or Mary Sue's stories with harm and encouraged them to commit suicide. Again, recall that not only were these authors mostly children, mostly girls, but their youth was often held up as a rationale for attacking their stories for the apparently grave offense of daring to place themselves inside a beloved liber literary work. Similar was the Mary Sue phenomenon. Mary Sue is a generally derogatory term that originated in Star Trek fandom for an idealized original female character who exerted enough influence to reshape the plot or cause characters to behave out of character. In the early online Tolkien fan fiction community, the use of the term Mary Sue is interesting because of how it umbrellaed very quickly until it encompassed nearly any story that involved an original female character. The presence of an original female character alone, no matter how well written, could earn disapprobation as a Mary Sue. In reading back through message archives for Tolkien fan fiction groups in the early to mid 2000s, I encountered anxiety from authors who wanted to write more women in their stories, but feared receiving the dreaded label of Mary Sue. Authors who did write women often took care to steer their characterization away from anything that suggested the traits of a Mary Sue, thus circumscribing the options available to women in their stories especially options that did allow these women to shape the story. Another genre similarly subjected to aggressive scrutiny and attack in the early online fandom was Slash, 
a genre of fan fiction where two same-sex characters are paired together romantically or sexually. Like Mary Sue, Slash has its origins in the Star Trek fandom and was a genre with decades of history before fan fiction migrated online in the early 2000s. Like Mary Sue's stories, within the early online Tolkien fan fiction fandom, Slash fiction was singled out for censure by other fans. Likewise, the canon was weaponized to conceal essentially homophobic objections within the guise of textual fidelity and respect for Tolkien. While also subjected to harassment, including threats of violence, Slash authors were often explicitly excluded from the mainstream fan fiction community. During this era, a time in US history littered with a record amounts of legislation excluding LGBTQ plus citizens from full involvement in family and cultural institutions, multiple large Tolkien fan fiction archives banned Slash. Because of this, and because Slash authors tended to be older than authors of Mary Sue's stories with more resources at their disposal, within the early online Tolkien fan fiction fandom, Slash authors tended to form their own communities where they could avoid harassment, the harassment they experienced on other sites. The end result was a fandom where queer characters, including the very idea that there would have been queer characters in Middle Earth, went unseen by fans. In early online Tolkien fan fiction, canon was often wielded against interpretations that allowed for greater representation of diverse perspectives. The sexist underpinnings of the concept of Mary Sue were rarely scrutinized because the genre was criticized under the guise of canonicity. And the result was that many authors feared writing even women who were a canonical presence in the legendarium. The canon also experienced a sort of mission creep. For example, Tolkien's Catholicism for many fans became an element of the canon. Never mind that no character within the legendarium would have identified as a Catholic. That Catholicism also narrowed to what the most conservative fans believed it to be and allowed no room for Tolkien to maintain a complex perspective beyond his religious beliefs. Thus, queer characters were marked as uncanonical and excluding fan fiction about LGBTQ plus characters became a simple matter of fidelity to the canon and not of homophobia and could not be questioned on those terms. Again and again, what some fans thought Tolkien meant or believed he intended was elevated to the status of canon where it was not open to question and where canonicity became a convenient diversion from discussions of sexism, racism, and homophobia in the fandom. Once again, it is worth remembering the size and diversity of the Tolkien fan fiction fandom at this time in history. Certainly there were communities that encouraged and discussed interpretations of the canon and stories featuring characters representing the full array of human diversity. However, returning to the academic view of fan fiction as a literature of the subordinate, as transgressive, as radical, as a means to amplify the voices and experiences of marginalized people, we can see that by and large in the early online mainstream fandom, Tolkien's fan fiction, Tolkien fan fiction's tendency toward a definition of canon as conservative in the sense of limiting rather than expanding possible perspectives foreclosed on many of these opportunities. Which brings us to the fandom as it exists today. Two decades after the release of The Fellowship of the Ring in theaters catapulted Tolkien to preeminent status in the early years of online fan fiction. Here I will turn to data from the Tolkien Fan Fiction Survey to gain a sense of how fans writing stories today use those stories or don't use those stories to draw forth diverse perspectives. First of all, who is writing and reading fan fiction about Tolkien's world? In 2020, Maria and I decided to expand out considerably the demographic information that we collected on participants. Some of that data is on the screen now. According to survey data, Tolkien fan fiction is largely written by college educated English speaking young women. Data on race and ethnicity was entirely up to the participant to define. As Maria and I designed the 2020 survey, including piloting it with other fans, we became increasingly aware of how our own definitions of terms like race and ethnicity were colored by our perce per perceptions as researchers located within the US. We ultimately decided, given the diversity of fans within the fan fiction community, to allow participants to self-describe. As a result, the data for this item should not be seen as either or. For example, that 71% of fans included the word white in their response does not mean that 29% of fans are black, indigenous, or people of color. However, as the word cloud shows, Tolkien fan fiction fandom is predominantly white and Western. Again, because the fan fiction community is international, US understandings of which identities would be perceived as marginalized did not necessarily hold true. Furthermore, even within the US, the experiences of a single identity group are far from monolithic, and we didn't want to assume marginalization or lack thereof based on a participant's response to any single item. Therefore, we also allowed participants to identify if and for which identities they felt marginalized. 
I will also use these data to show how values and behaviors related to fan fiction vary among different groups of fans. Beginning with those previously maligned female characters, we see that in both the 2015 and 2020 surveys, authors expressed a high level of interest in using their fan fiction to explore the perspectives of female characters, with 2020 showing a slight bump over the earlier survey. However, while it is one thing to take on the perspectives of diverse characters, to what extent are authors comfortable firstly admitting that there are problems with how race, gender, and sexuality are depicted in the legendarium, and then going the extra length to use their stories to correct these problems? Here we see the number of authors drop off quite a bit, though I include two data sets here. The graph on the right shows authors who identified as marginalized based on gender. Among those authors, reparative motives are far more comfortable and common. We'll see this pattern emerge again. When asked about using fan fiction to explore the perspective, perspectives of LGBTQ plus characters, we see less agreement than the same item about female characters. However, a majority of authors still agreed and there is the same small bump from 2015 to 2020. When we look at slash authors specifically, not surprisingly, almost all of them agreed with this survey item, which makes sense since they are by definition writing about LGBTQ plus characters. But again, among authors who identified as marginalized based on sexual orientation, the number who agreed with this item was significantly higher than for authors in general, suggesting that perception of marginalization motivates creating stories that represent groups in Middle Earth similar to the marginalized groups to which the author belongs. Next, we asked about race. Here, the numbers start to look different, though similar patterns continue to hold across three, the three categories of questions. Far fewer authors expressed interest in using fan fiction to incorporate the perspectives of characters of color. Returning to the earlier demographic data, this is possibly due to the relatively few fans who identify as parts of these groups themselves. Only 6% of participants felt marginalized based on race or color compared to 58 and 41% for sexual orientation and gender respectively. When asked about correcting problems with race, Interestingly, more authors agreed than on the question about exploring the perspectives of characters of color. And once again, we see that among BIPOC authors, this number increases. Among authors who identify as marginalized based on race or color, the number increases yet again until it looks more like the graphs for gender and sexual orientation presented earlier. Taken all together, the data suggests that authors often represent the experiences of characters like them and especially when they identify as part of a marginalized group, they are motivated to not only represent those characters, but repair areas where the texts fall short of complex, non-stereotyped depictions of diverse characters. Furthermore, it is important to consider these data within the fandom's historical context, which was not traditionally friendly to authors wishing to use their stories to expand upon the canon, much less correct it. When the implication is that Tolkien fell short in how he wrote the Legendarium, Stories that explore gender and sexuality could have been passed over by readers uninterested in the subject or who felt uncomfortable or disagreed with the implied critique of Tolkien. Instead, the authors of these stories were subjected to the kinds of harassment, including threats of violence and exclusion that often mirror real world marginalization of the groups they were writing about. As I noted, canon was weaponized in these situations and used to silence criticism of fans attacking authors who wrote about women or LGBTQ plus characters. Those readers objected to distortion of the canon, not to the presence per se of women or queer characters or characters of color, they said, never mind that their definition of canon foreclosed upon any opportunity for meaningful inclusion of those characters. But it doesn't have to be this way. Part of Tolkien's genius was that he crafted the legendarium to always invite readers to journey imaginatively beyond the people, places, and perspectives that received his focus. When Aragorn mentions going where the stars are strange, Tolkien expands his map for readers who wish to see and see themselves in those lands. His presentation of his work as historical artifacts invite the reader to imagine those same people and events seen through other eyes. These devices and details are equally canonical, maybe even more so than those used to exclude diverse fans who imagine the legendarium has room for them, as it does. Survey data shows that Tolkien fan fiction writers still hold an immense regard, almost a reverence for the canon and often for Tolkien himself. It is through a fuller understanding of what that canon includes and who it invites into the stories it tells that has begun to evolve. Thank you.
That was fascinating. Thank you so much, Dawn, for um, a, a, a further um, bringing a further component um, into our seminar and greater topic as well. So a fascinating insight into the world of fan fiction. Um, now, we do have a range of questions, so we are going to jump straight into them. OK, so um, our first question asks, uh, do you feel that talking fandoms still choose certain platforms for their work based on the likely reaction of fanfic communities to them? Or does uh, the homogenizing of the internet mean most writers post on the same few sites? That is a great question and it gets to the heart of one of my interests that I didn't talk about today, which is what I call the fandom infrastructure. So the different sites and archives that Tolkien fan fiction writers use. So traditionally, when we go back to that early mid 2000s, there were literally dozens of archives and, and hundreds if not thousands of smaller groups on so what was sort of early versions of social media like Yahoo groups, live journal and so on. And we have definitely seen a lot of those die in recent years. Um, most activity now based on the 2020 survey data occurs on an archive of our own, also known as AO3 um, and Tumblr. But there's still, there's still a lot more diversity, I think, in the Tolkien fan fiction community than there are in other fan fiction fandoms. Um, I'm kind of a prime example. I founded the Silmarillion Writers Guild, which is a fan fiction archive for stories based on the Silmarillion back in 2005, and we are still going stronger than ever. Um, and there's some other Tolkien specific archives that still exist out there, as well as other options for multi fandom archives, such as Wattpad and fanfiction.net, that people, um, especially fanfiction.net, receives a lot of um, posting from people. And they do definitely self select where they post. Um, I've done a, quite a bit of writing on this for anybody that's interested in diving deeper into that question. Um, fans definitely self select where they post based on the culture of those communities. So there are some communities that are more receptive to um, writing about women or other marginalized groups of characters than others. And fans definitely um, choose where they post based on their, their interest in that among other areas. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, our second question asks, um, does the low percentage of respondents quoting race as their marginalized status indicate the seemingly obvious conclusion that the legendarium is not appealing enough to people of color? I have been, that, that's another great question because I've been mulling over since I ran this data, um, I've been mulling that over because um, I, I looked up some census data for the US anyway. And of course, you know, we're dealing with an international community. So it's really often impossible to quantify and compare um, in ways that are fully accurate. But within the US, 40% in the last census apparently identified um, groups other than white. So the fact that we're only getting about 13% of people who are identifying somewhere, you know, that could be considered black indigenous or people of color is really interesting to consider why. Is it the legendarium itself or is it the fandom that is that is proven hostile? Um, I mean, I think the experiences of you know this the seminar and the reaction to it definitely show. Um, I think a lot of fans kind of got, you know, a dash of cold water to the face that I think a lot of people from marginalized groups that are in the fandom are like, yes, and you know, that's something that they've been experiencing for a long time. Um, that came as a surprise, I think, to, to people who have never had reason to experience that before. So I'm not sure where the, where the reasoning is, but I definitely think that as a fandom and you know, as the owner of a fandom group myself, you know, it, it, it sort of forces us to consider you know, what we are doing um, to make our, our spaces more inviting. Wonderful, quite in depth as well. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, our third question asks, how might Tolkien's canon and the way that it changes over drafts support diverse interpretations in fan fiction? Could this have something to do with um, Tolkien um, fic writers' reliance on both affirmative and transformative methods? Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, we're, we're looking at how um, the changes in drafts influence fan fiction. And I want, to I want to define two terms in there, since this is not necessarily a fan studies audience. Um, affirmative or affirmational and transformational are two types, types of fandom on a continuum. So they're not binary, even though they're often depicted that way. 
So affirmational would be people who um, place a lot of place a lot of stock in the authority of the original creator, whereas transformational are people who um, are placed a lot of stock in the perspectives of readers and fans. So fan fiction is generally placed by scholars more towards the transformational end. I make the argument in some of my um, papers that Tolkien fan fiction actually occupies a very middle ground. We're very affirmational. We love, we love ourselves, our canon, you know, <laughs> and Tolkien fan fiction writers are some of the best, you know, most knowledgeable people when it comes to that canon of, of people that I've met. But at the same time, we, we play with it, right? And we, we see ourselves, we write to see ourselves in the stories very often. Um, as far as considering those various drafts, um, I do think that, you know, among, you know, Tolkien fans, I think that most fan fiction writers are aware of the various drafts. Um, and I've seen them use, I've seen it used in a lot of different ways. There are people who have a very coherent way of defining what counts as canon for them. So, you know, Tolkien's last word is one you'll hear fairly often um, where a fan fiction writer will say, well, this was what I analyze, not necessarily Christopher Tolkien or any other scholar, but this is what my research shows that I analyze as Tolkien's final word. The parentage of, of Gelgalad would be, you know, a prime example where Christopher Tolkien's interpretation and fan fiction writers' interpretations are often very different. Um, but then there are people who just kind of go wild and crazy in the drafts and pick the details that they like. So I think that you see a spectrum of anywhere in there as far as what people, how people respond. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, um, especially that concept um, of the spectrum of it as well. And um, people kind of dive in and take out what they want um, as well. It's like, uh, you know, sometimes when you see like people go in and they take out like a, a small quotation, but actually that, you know, there's a large context behind that as well so yeah it's it's um a tricky ground i think as you've uh, kind of identified um okay um our next question then um starts off by saying thank you for this fascinating um analysis um the questioner has a personal question if you if you would be okay with a personal question um do you engage with fan fiction and if so uh do you have a particular topic slash characters that you prefer or most like to engage with? Are these topics slash characters something you feel are lacking diversity in the canon? So I do write fan fiction. That's how I how I got into all of this, so to speak. Um, I run the Silmarillion Writers Guild, which honestly and a bit ironically means that I have less time to write fan fiction than if I didn't run a fan fiction group. <laughs> But you know, it, it opens up a space for lots of other people to write stories. Um, my own personal interests have always lied more with. Um, well, I write about the Silmarillion, obviously the Silmarillion Writers Guild, and I'm ex especially interested in the Feanorians, um, the House of Feanor. So that that and that kind of led into some of my scholarly work because my Tolkien studies work, not my fan studies work, is around the the narrators and historical bias in the Legendarium. Um, which I, which originally like was pinged for me as a fan fiction writer writing about the Feanorians and realizing that there's a very clear bias in the text. And so once I saw that, it, it's kind of, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so it, you know, then, then you see it everywhere. You know, you see how certain groups are talked about or they're excluded entirely. They're present, but they're not discussed or they are, they're discussed, but they're discussed in one set of terms versus another group receives different a different focus or a different quality of attention um, than that other group. So I have definitely turned my attention in, in recent years to writing about female characters um, in the legendarium. So that is a that is a group of characters that you know historically in Tolkien fan fiction did not receive positive attention. Um, or at least the reactions to those stories often did not receive positive attention that has particularly interested me as a writer. <laughs> 